I have assembled some of the best experts in the XRP space to discuss one really simple question that I think nobody has actually ever addressed, and that is, what is value? When we hear people say value stored on the XRP ledger or on the blockchain, what does that actually mean? Where is it? If it's not a physical thing, where is the value? So we get into that and dive into lots of topics like set price theory and talking about how the government may have a set price. But first, a message from a new friend of the channel. As we all know, security is crucial in the world of digital currencies. And I've got something to share with you that can help protect your online presence from potential threats. This video is sponsored by NordVPN, an amazing cybersecurity tool that helps protect your online connection and privacy online. To get an exclusive deal from NordVPN, go to nordvpn.com forward slash Lulu. Now let's talk about a common threat that you'll find in crypto. It's something called man in the middle attacks. And these attacks happen when somebody intercepts your data and your connection to the internet. And this can be on public Wi-Fi or other vulnerable connections. For example, you might be checking your crypto portfolio on a public Wi-Fi. And without knowing it, a hacker could be stealing your passwords. And that's where NordVPN comes in. They have top-notch encryption, they secure your internet traffic. And so if somebody does try to intercept your connection, all they'll see from the data is gibberish. Plus, NordVPN has a feature called threat protection, and that keeps you safe from malware and other online dangers. Do not let hackers steal your crypto assets or your information. Get NordVPN now by clicking the link in the description, or again, visit nordvpn.com forward slash Lulu. What's really good is that there's a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's actually no risk at all, and see how it can enhance your online safety. And what's even better than that is that they're gonna give you four months extra when you buy a two year plan, so remember, your online security is in your hands. So go to nordvpn.com slash Lulu and get yourself protected. Back to the video. Okay, so last week in the Discord on the Members Insights number three, we had Robert Doyle or Crypto Sensei in. This is where we kind of bring someone who's knowledgeable in the field, an expert in the field, and they talk to our members just about anything really that is of interest to them that can educate the audience. And we stumbled upon the conversation of value and where value is held, specifically talking about the XRP ledger. This is something that over the last two years, specifically when I've been making content, every time I've heard somebody say, we, that as soon as this happens in the market, then value gets added to the ledger and that affects the price of XRP. And I've breezed over it, I have to admit, and it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but you know, we're all learning. Yeah. I breezed over that and I never kind of looked further or deeper into what value was. Like if this is all based on code or cryptography, like our, our definition of value, which you could say is like physical value in, in coins that we've been used to or whatever, like that doesn't make sense on a ledger with when you're talking about code. So where is where does value actually sit? And I would say that in the last conversation, even though we didn't get to an answer, that's for the point of this episode, there were more, I've never seen so many people in, in comments and afterwards message me and say, I finally had the light bulb moment. Even though they've been in, the, in, in this market for and in XRP for years, right? People finally like it clicking. Um, and that's really important to me. So if we can get to further define what value is, where value is stored, the different arguments, and even what is XRP, because even if you've been here for a while, you still might not actually know what XRP's role is in a payment. Um, even though you might know it settles, there's more to it. <laughs> there's a lot more to it. Um, so there were two sides of the argument that we went into last time. We're going to do that again in here, just briefly, and then we're just going to talk in a, as a group about all of that. So let's start with uh, Crypto Sensei, Robert Doyle. What was your side in all of this? So my, the, the way I think about this is everything in the future uh, or is now being tokenized or sandbox tokenized right now. We're talking stocks, bonds, equities, gold, uh, natural gas, uh, carbon credits, uh, anything of, of real actual value is going to is going to be tokenized. Der the derivatives market is what I'm really interested in, right? That's 600 trillion to one quadrillion dollars. So my thought was, what would be the perfect place 
for that value, right? For for smart contract derivatives to be on on a, on an, on a, a bridge asset, which basically can go in any kind of direction, whichever pairs currency pairs are paired to it, you know, or whatever somebody wants to do. So I thought, hey, if if you know, ten percent, which is let's say let's say it's six hundred, uh, let's just use a, a trillion dollars just to make it easy, and ten percent is a hundred trillion dollars. So if a hundred trillion dollars of derivatives value was was put in smart contracts to futures contracts and put on uh the xrp ledger now would that value live on the xrp ledger that was my understanding and futures understanding was a little different and i'll let him explain his side of it and then we can kind of figure out uh who, who is right and who is wrong and, and and maybe we're both right and we're both wrong at the same time but go ahead, <laughs> yeah. go ahead well, hey everybody Perfect. uh wow uh appreciate it, lewis Versan, Patrick, Robert, Molly. Uh, never, never thought I'd be sitting here talking to you guys at all. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I don't want to say this is an argument. I think it's a spirited discussion in a speculative environment with different points of view. Um, plain and simple. Uh, Robert just said it. We, we could all be wrong. We, we don't know until the thing actually happens. But to the topic, um, XRPL is a value transfer mechanism or a payment rail. And XRP, the native token, is the rail cars, the train cars on those rails. They transmit value. That is it. That is the bare bones block building structure of the XRPL to transmit value, period. Now, can you do other things with XRP like an NFT? Sure. If, if you want to paint pretty pictures with, uh, with your XRP, go ahead. Um, Honestly, I encourage it because it takes XRP out of circulation and makes mine more valuable eventually. So go ahead. Okay. So so why? Why why does that why does holding an NFT that is worth something that has value why does that make an XRP more valuable? Because eventually that pretty picture that somebody spent 77 XRP on today that at 40 cents cost about 30 bucks. Uh, eventually, let's use a round number of a thousand dollar XRP. That pretty picture is now they spent $35 on, and it in theory it's worth $77,000, and they can't get $77,000 for it because you can't back out of an NFT to create XRP again. So they've taken 77 XRP out of potential liquidity pools of circulation, which supply and demand, a lower, a lower quantity will have to increase the value of what's left. So paint all the pretty pictures you want. So uh, I, if I can throw in there. <clears throat> so everyone thinks about the Bitcoin uh, pizza story, right? That somebody spent 10,000 Bitcoin on a couple of Papa John's large uh, pizzas. Hopefully no pineapple. I don't know the background, but uh, <laughs> everyone forgets that uh, somebody also got paid 10,000 Bitcoin for those two pizzas. Absolutely. Right? So it, in the case of NFTs, yes, somebody is is paying that xrp to uh, acquire the nft but somebody's also receiving that xrp and that's still in circulation it's still liquidity so okay. i think we're actually talking about two different things here so there's value that lives on the ledger and then there's also the payments so when you're sending a payment it's instant liquidity and you're saying okay i just sent a million dollars from the us to france and it's cashed out in france and that added that million dollars to the ledger for you know three to five seconds worth of value right uh if we're talking about something that lives on the ledger and has value permanently then we're talking about something that can only be accessed through xrp so 
you know, we can tokenize things like wine or art or gold or other assets, right? But those things can also be transferred outside of XRP. XRP has to be the only way to reach something of value for that value to live on the XRP ledger, which is why if XRP becomes global reserve currency de facto because it is the world bridge currency, then that would mean everything lives on the ledger because everything has to go through XRP to get there. But currently, if we were to say, I'm tokenizing a, a kilogram of gold and it's worth, you know, 100,000 XRP or whatever the exchange rate is, uh, that doesn't mean I can't take that gold out to a, a pawn shop and sell it at spot right now when somebody's still holding that XRP certificate. So I, I think the confusion is, is what's tokenized still able to be sold outside of the ledger? And if that's true, then that value does not live on the ledger. I'd like to clarify too, this idea of value living on the ledger, because I think that conceptually can be difficult to imagine. Let's just use the example of tokenized gold where somewhere a physical bar of gold exists. You're like, how can this physical thing be on a software ledger? This is where this idea of property rights is important to understand. When you own a physical asset or any kind of asset, you have various rights associated with that asset. I can sell it, I could lend it, I could bury it, I could you know, do all these different things with it. And that is actually what gets tokenized on the ledger are the property rights associated with ownership. And I don't have to tokenize all of the property rights. This is why like if I had a bunch of gold and I wanna create a gold backed currency, you as the user of that currency may have the right to redeem the gold or not. Like that could be part of the deal regarding tokenization. So when value exists on the ledger, especially some external physical third party value like gold or real estate or art or whatever, it is not the actual thing itself. It is the various property rights associated with ownership that are essentially a contract. And this is why NFTs and, and the ledger are uh, all the ledgers are great for tokenization because those contracts can be programmed in. Smart contracts can be you know created to determine if then statements about when you would sell or transfer those property rights. And that's what the accounting ledger, especially XRP LR, are ledgers that document the transfer of various property rights between two parties but molly just hit on it it's the transfer of the value i think i think the word i think we're and and again this is just my simplistic view robert and i'm not arguing i'm just looking at things differently i think the, i think the word live representation and corresponding value are all being interchanged here. Yeah. The no, I understand. So, the gold so analogy I, that Molly just used sure. in, in our discussion, our little, our DM chat, I used, uh, I think I sent a picture. I don't remember. I'm, I'm pen and paper. I've got a yellow notepad and a pen here in front of me right now. Um, but just use the U.S., and the UK. You got the Bank of England and, and Fort Knox. Now, Bank of England has tokenized their gold, and Molly has touched on this in a previous about the ability to trade gold around the world without flying planes. Versan touched on this in a video, you know, where countries will settle and do their deals with tokenized, tokenized gold on the Fort Knox ledger and the Bank of England ledger and everything's tokenized and auditable, which is a Molly hit on that about, I, I think she used a quarterly uh, audit to make sure everybody's on the, on the up and up. And then occasionally they actually settle. But that, that value of the tokenized gold, that value is represented on the value of XRP because the liquidity has to be there. But it would actually be in the XLS 30D amendment when it comes in, it will be setting in the XRP XAU pair. 
to move that gold between the Fort Knox ledger and the Bank of England's ledger. And that value, I agree, has to be there to move that gold, but it doesn't live there. The value lives at Fort Knox, and the value lives at the Bank of England. Can we use something other than gold? Because gold is, you know, we've we've gone kind of gone down this this corn, but let's let's corn like stock bonds or or derivatives, right? So those assets has to be custody somewhere, and they're going to be digitalized custody, right? They're going to be digital representations of those stocks and bonds. They already are. Exactly, they already are. So so if if those tokenized stocks and bonds decided there was a there was a company that built out <clears throat> on the XRPL to custody those assets. Now those assets would in fact live on the XRPL until those assets are sold and moved somewhere else. Is that not accurate? Okay, let me okay. I'm gonna answer a question with a question. You just said and, and I think everybody here can agree right now. The New York Stock Exchange is digitized. Correct? Am I am I wrong there? You're talking about ICE. You're talking about ICE, is the, the 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 partner of the the uh, the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, it, it's digital. Home. You you don't get a stock certificate anymore. Yeah, well, the it, it, custody is still held at custodian places, right? That's where the certificates are are held. Okay, right? you don't get it. They are still held somewhere. Okay, well, so, so if somebody is holding it, then they are then they the value is resting right there, right now. Correct. Yes. So a stock is an intangible, right? So gold is something tangible that you know possession is nine tenths of the law. And if we took our gold and we sold it, regardless of what's on the XRP ledger, obviously someone's going to pay us for that gold, right? So if we're talking intangibles, things like stocks, derivatives, uh, quant markets, then yes, that can all be put on the blockchain. And effectively what a blockchain is, is it makes a physical object in a digital universe. Yep. So I agree with Future that everything that is stocks and uh, bonds, all these things are effectively digital. Even when they're on paper, they're still just, it's just a paper ledger. It's still uh, intangible that uh, you can rip that up and, and there's no proof it exists. So I think that putting value on the ledger for intangibles is, is very possible, whereas putting value on the ledger for tangible objects has to be something where it's a, a fractionalized ownership in that asset. Basically, it would be a security. I hate that word. Everyone does, right? But uh, that's that's the only way to put a, a physical object onto a ledger. Uh, so my... My thought process is that if the value exists, because really, really all the audience cares about is if the price of XRP is going to go up. They don't really care about what value is defined as, but value value helps us to see when when an increase in an XRP price is like warranted, if you know what I mean. So if it is only used in the transaction, and if you've got large large amounts of assets tokenized or you know when we talk about value being added to the ledger my my thing is you know it has to be moving all the time to actually see the price of xrp go up anything meaningful and it has to be there has to be such a high volume of transactions all the time but if you're using xrp for transactions on a daily basis why would you keep selling it if you're just gonna turn around and buy it again tomorrow Eventually, it's just more efficient for you to hold it because you're going to need it for the next transaction. And if you're going to pay me for widgets, I don't really want your sovereign currency. So pay me an XRP because I'm going to need XRP tomorrow. And the more this happens like systemically, the more XRP is pulled out of circulation because it's more efficient for me to hold it than to keep selling it and running the risk of the price going up tomorrow. Um, Also, if I'm running a profitable business or my trade, my country has like trade surplus where we're, you know, we're making more money than we're spending. I got to store my profit somewhere. Historically, all of our lives, that profit has kind of been stored in U.S. dollars. And if we no longer are going to have a sovereign currency be the global reserve, there's going to be 
a need for the replacement. Where do I park my money while I'm waiting to buy the next thing? If XRP is being used for those transactions and the value is steadily going up, why wouldn't I store my value in XRP? Because it's something I'm going to need anyway. Yeah, and and also to hit off that point, Molly, too, when when a sovereign nation creates a CBDC on a private ledger, right, and they create five trillion dollars or five trillion pounds or whatever it is for stimulus or whatever, does now does that five trillion dollars of value live on the ledger, or is that five trillion dollars now floating out there on some some private chain? I I, I I'm really trying to, you know, on it. Because you're 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 very, I think you're one of the more knowledgeable people about this. Uh, what does that money now live there, right? Because you have the U.S., you have Canada, you have probably Brazil, you have the U.K., you have Sama, you have uh, Japan, you have a lot of central banks that are going to be using the XRPL or private ledger uh, or Corda for a, a CBDC. Where does that value live? I think you're getting into the concept of whether or not all this value would be tokenized and used as collateral. Is it sort of this collateralization model where XRP then becomes functionally a derivative of every other asset that is tokenized? Um, this is a very controversial, debatable topic, but it speaks to this idea of efficiency that if I have all these tokens that represent physical assets and I'm using them for trade, we're going back and forth and we're constantly using an ODL to swap from one currency to the other. Eventually, that just becomes kind of a hassle if XRP is being used as the intermediary token in all these transactions. And eventually people are like, why do I have to bother switching back to my currency when I have to turn it back around into XRP again tomorrow? And this is where the thesis of XRP becoming a global reserve currency, my take as it comes from, is it's an efficiency mechanism. If everybody, if the majority of people are using XRP for transactions, it just becomes easier to just price an XRP and pay an XRP and store value at XRP versus constantly switching in and out of other currencies. Mm, I want to hear Va Vasan because uh, Vasan talked to me. Uh, wh where did we talk? I think it was in Signal or something. Um, but you, you, you've got knowledge about how these things work on a technical level as well, which I think a lot of people don't know. Um, I'd love to hear. Love to hear sure. what you have to First say. Well, I want to touch back on what we initially were discussing: the value, right? First of all, value in the context of the XRP ledger, basically we're referring to the worth, the worth of digital assets that are being exchanged on the network. And also we have to bear in mind that the value of XRP ledger is not necessarily limited to XRP alone. The ledger also supports the creation of um, and uh, the exchange of other digital assets, such as stable coins, security tokens, uh, NFTs, et cetera. Uh, and so basically these assets can be used to represent a wide range of financial uh, real world assets, such as fiat currencies, commodities, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the key features uh, when we're talking about value, you know, overall, what I think is happening is the tokenization of global financial markets. It's likely to, uh, it is going that way for sure, but it's going to have a very positive impact on the value of XRP as well. So when we talk about value, I think there's also a lot of, um, People still don't really understand what we're trying to explain here, but it, it, it's, it's fairly simple to understand. You know, I, I think a lot of what we're doing also is kind of, uh, we're trying to make it easy for people to understand, but also we are kind of complicating it a bit, um, just being very direct about it. But basically, uh, you know, we, we keep getting away from what the, the end game here is. It's really the potential to increase, uh, it's based on utility not just as a bridge currency, but it's a financial instrument that's being used to serve the global economy. So I think uh, a lot of the other stuff around it, um, you know, it's important to discuss, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear what the utility is of this technology. And it's basically tokenizing the global economy and kind of just putting it on the ledger, really. And I, I would point out that I, I know XRP is primarily a financial mechanism. Everyone talks about it between banks, between countries, but we're looking right now down the barrel at hyper tokenization within the next five years. It has to happen uh, primarily because of AI. So we have AIs making images, making audios, making videos, right? So within five years, we're going to have a situation where 
you won't know if the video you're watching online came from a real news source or just somebody who kicked in a prompt to say, make a video by Fox News. Uh, will Fox News know if the video they got from the White House was really from the White House saying that X happened, right? So everything that is digital of any form has to go onto a blockchain within five years or it will not be valid. You won't be able to have court admissible evidence from a CCTV if it is not tracked to a blockchain because it is not beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, when we say everything has to be tokenized, what does that really mean? Well, if we look at Ethereum and gas fees, what does it mean over there versus if we look at uh, things like XRP with a three to five second transaction and minimum fees? So yes, XRP is a financial instrument, but there's many other ways to use it. And right now it needs to be used globally for many other purposes. So that is all going to start to be tokenized. One more thing I'd like to point yeah. out. Is can I, also, can I, oh yeah, I'm sorry, on, sorry. Real quick. the tokenization is going to allow for greater liquidity and transparency and accessibility of yeah. these assets that we're talking about, as well as the faster settlement times and reduced transaction costs. So it's just a stream of positive news, to be honest. Yeah, so I get, I get it. I get that. But there's things that aren't fully clicking for me still. Like I, I, I understand like the zoomed out perspective. It's very simple, as, as we've said. But I, if I know anything from myself at school, I went through school like just hating it, as many people did. But it was not because I, I wasn't curious to learn. I was like massively curious. But the teachers weren't saying they weren't going deep enough. So I, it, it, it never clicked. So I never. I just never got that interested in school because it was never deep enough. Um, and it was always a few layers deeper that would allow me to understand the full, the full thing, the way I wanted to understand it. So there's, yes. there's two things I don't get still. One is if XRP is used in transactions and that's what moves the value, but you can also have, you can hold XRP the token, but then you can also hold tokenized assets on the ledger. I understand how holding XRP the token increases the value of XRP because XRP specifically is being taken out of circulation in order for, and, and then there's less available to do the transactions, therefore higher price. But the other one, if there's another token that's on the ledger and that's you know, being held there was tokenized version of something that doesn't require a specific amount of XRP to be kind of held up to hold that value. So there is no value in that asset being on the ledger apart from when it's transacted with. Correct. So, so what, so how are we agreeing the price of the asset? That's so not I, I would go back to the Bacchus model that Molly did a great breakdown of, but basically you're saying we have some people holding XRP and that means they've lowered the total supply, the total um, space through which value can move. So volume equals value. So it's the remainder of liquidity in the XRP divided against the total volume of XRP demand. Uh, and that is where we get value, right? Yeah. So that is effectively, you know, how both removing it off the market can help price. But if it's removed off the market and nobody's demanding what's left, then the price isn't going to move. Right. So the more use of, of the ledger, the greater the value. Yeah. I think it's unlikely too that all the value would ever be available for transactions because why, why do these banks have options agreements to buy XRP if they have no plan to hold it? Like, what's the point of that then? I'm just going to buy it when I need it and sell it again when I need it. Then why do those, why does the escrow exist with these agreements? Yeah. And, and, and do you think Molly, do you think that, that some cryptocurrencies are going to become like tier one assets, you know, like gold and, 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 and some, some stocks and some, some, some security. So banks can actually physically hold certain amounts of them. Uh, I, that, that's the way I think regulation is going. They're going to have, you know, tier eight, tier one, tier two, and then, you know, 
whatever the hell, whatever the hell the rest of it is, and it's going to get rid of a lot of the, the cryptocurrency market, right? Um, I, personally, do you think that they're going to do anything with, with the tier system so banks can hold more crypto assets? I know they're going to want to custody your assets, right? That's the first, that's what they're trying to do, right? Is, you know, they want to custody your money. Of course, they want to custody your crypto. Uh, but do you think crypto will be in it tiered, uh, tier, in, in tier, tiered asset type of way? So my understanding of tier one assets is it's the most liquid, valuable form of money and very few assets get that level. Like the dollar is tier one asset, gold is a tier one asset. I guess it's potentially possible that XRP could be considered a tier one asset. I think that would happen if banks collectively decided that, that it's going to functionally serve as the new reserve currency and they would want price stability. I'm still open to the idea that there could be a set price in the future because it is in the interest of nations and banks who hold a lot of XRP for that price to be stable. Because if they want to use it as collateral for loans and the price is going up and down, they're going to get margin called on them, which they don't want. So a very high stable price actually benefits the banking industry. And that's the crowd who has the ability to get together like a Plaza Accord or a Bretton Woods and say, we are going to agree that this price is going to be at this level and we're going to lock, we're going to have a, a gated marketplace where we exchange value and we agree that it is this high value. Uh, well, the Bacchus I, I model also alluded to the fact that a very high stable price is in the interest of everyone involved. I, I think um, Black Swan, I, sorry, man, I can't remember your name. I apologize. But I think you've actually had okay. a conversation with someone that was, in, uh, thank you so much. But you've actually had a physical conversation with somebody that is inside of a central bank that talks about a pre-allocated price, right? Yes. If I remember well, correctly, first of all, you to and clarify, Lewis talked about that. Yes, to clarify, I should have never mentioned her name. And I did get some backlash yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. I, I, I exposed, I, I, exposed a yeah. source and I shouldn't have done that. And um, I got carried away in our conversation. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, what I was trying to say is that this, everything we're talking about here really ties back to the financial system. And if you look what's happening with the masses and the public, they're suing this ripple, the ripple lawsuit. It's a sham. We all know this, but behind all of this, um, while this is going on publicly and people are like, oh, uh, lawsuit. Uh, it's not good. It's they did something wrong. Behind all of this, we see the adoption accelerating. It's happening nonstop. Um, every major financial institution. In fact, this is interesting. I was on the phone with my cousin yesterday. He's in Saudi Arabia. His father works for SAB, big bank in Saudi Arabia. And he, I actually asked him to go ask his superiors if he knew anything about XRP. You're not going to believe what he said. We know about the technology. We uh, are not sure what's going to happen with XRP itself because of the lawsuit, but we are still having an emergency plan to adopt the central bank digital currency that Ripple provides. So that is still happening for an emergency. My point, though, is that the acceleration is still happening behind closed doors. None of this would have taken place unless there was an agreement. And again, it goes back to the financial system. I believe it's going to be uh, the, the, the chain reaction of the banking crisis. It's not an accident. Um, they're going to let this thing, the contagion spread to where the crisis is big enough to where the Federal Reserve really can't do anything about it or the FDIC to where the IMF will have to step in. And if we look at Ripple, they've been working very closely on high level discussions on financial technology with the IMF and not just the IMF, some of the other larger institutions, too. So I believe they're going to create a situation where it's going to be a big problem where the IMF will have to step in. And they're going to do something with the XRP, but the price is going to be set. It's going to have to be set at a high price. And that's also what I was told by a few other people, too. So, so, you know. Well, also, too, if you look at if you look globally, just at the U.S., the U.K. and Canada, I mean, listen to this about how much money moves per day. The FX market is seven point five trillion per day. Derivatives is between yearly 600 billion to 1 quadrillion. Nacha is a US payment system, 72 trillion annually. SEPA is about 2.8 trillion euros annually. Fedwire is 4.2 trillion daily. SWIFT is about 400 billion uh, a day. Federal Reserve is 100 billion a day. DTCC is six to seven trillion a day. CHIPS is 1.8 trillion, uh, which is about 657 trillion yearly. Fedwire is 1.3 trillion a day. Crest, which is the uh, UK's 
uh, system for clearing securities is 600 billion and Canada is yearly is about 539 billion. You're talking about, you know, about 20, 21 trillion dollars just in those payment systems daily alone, not including the rest of the world. Right. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, at what point do banks start saying, hey, do we still keep using this current corresponding banking system or do we go over here and save 80 to 90 percent? using a much easier, faster, more efficient, more uh, uh, stabilized system? Do you know, like when, when is that flip of the switch moment, do you guys think? Or, or do you think XRP won't be used for any of that? Well, I, real quick, just to touch on this, and I'll let you guys finish. But uh, basically, the, you know, the traditional financial system is facing so many issues, a range of challenges and uncertainties. And I believe that all the investors and they're turning to physical assets and alternative investments as well. So what we're seeing with this banking crisis is not just the consolidation of power and a tightened grip on the economy and whatnot, but it's also the move towards where what we're talking about. It's happening faster. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up actually. Yeah. Um, there's gonna be a moment where I believe the liquidity crisis is the big crux here because uh, global markets are drying up. Um, financial resources are being severely constrained. And as a result, there's going to be a point where the global markets are going to look for an alternative source for a sustainable uh, monetary supply. And we don't have that. Um, so it's, it's really unfolding very fast, but I believe this is all tied into everything and you know, we're getting closer. So I really don't know when that's going to happen. There's one influence I wouldn't, one influence that I wouldn't rule out is having a role here, which is the correspondent banks that make a lot of money off the current system. And the fact that they're just going to like walk away and be like, Oh, well, Screw it. We're done with all those fees from cross-border payments. They have a lot of influence. They have power. They hold the accounts for a lot of very influential businesses and countries. So I don't think it really happens until the major correspondent banking system participants decide that it's in their interest to switch to a new system, even well, just for cross-border. It's, it's JP Morgan, City, and HSBC are responsible for like 60% or 70% of international payments, right? And we know JP Morgan has a lot of uh, 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 sway or whatever over Ethereum. And that's why, you know, that's my reason why I think they slow down Ripple just because they're making all of these fees and all of this money off the current system. Current system is is, is completely broken, right? No stroke, no stroke. The whole thing is completely broken. Molly, where, where do you think the breaking point is? I mean, how many more banks need to fail? Or, 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 or I mean, obviously Gensler is getting paid by... Uh, you know, JP Morgan or whatever to, to totally create confusion and, 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 and not make clear rules of the road in the U S push everything offshore. I mean, he, he, he clearly has an agenda here, right? So what is, what is the breaking point in, in your mind that all of this kind of happen, has to happen anyways, right? I mean, it, it can't keep going on forever. I mean, I think what we're paying almost a trillion dollars yearly in just federal debt, right? So at what point does the system break? So I'm a subscriber of the Tom Luongo thesis that there is a faction war going on within the banking cartel and that the European led cartel, primarily based in the city of London, often referred to as the Davos cartel, is at war with the New York Wall Street slash Fed cartel. It's why the Fed keeps raising rates. The, mar the goal there is to break the euro dollar market as we transition from uh, LIBOR to SOFR. And there's sort of a whole lot of corruption craziness with the LIBOR thing. Yeah. Uh, so if that is the case, then JP Morgan and Gensler are not friends. They're not on the same side. Gensler is absolutely part of the Davos cartel. He's got long ties to the, the you know, World Economic Forum type people who generally speak on behalf of the European banking system. So I think we're going to have to see who wins. Is the mm -hmm. New York Fed banking system going to win as we see them split off from the European banking system? Or will the European banks prevail? I'm not really sure. There is also another thesis that there really aren't many banks. There is one bank. Every other bank is a subsidiary of the one bank. And so there is sometimes this illusion that all these banks are competing with one another where really they are just all flavors of the same ice cream. Is it, well, is it, is it a silly thing to think that actually... <laughs> I, I don't know how I've never said this out loud, so I'm trying to put it in my head. If the banks make a lot of fees now, make a lot of money off the fees right now, 
I also have a thought process where nothing on the public view changes at all when the switch happens and no one knows except those who are in the right asset. You just hit it the nail on the it. head. You just hit yeah. the they nail on the head, make, Lewis. They stand to make so much more money with the fees yeah. if they just keep the fees the same but reduce their cost. How do we know they didn't switch already? The fee to the customer is going to stay the same. The cost to the bank is going to be reduced. Yes, yeah. substantially, substantially, right? There are more money. If, if it has switched already, shouldn't there have been some movement in, in, in like, shouldn't, shouldn't the asset we're in have had some movement? So going through all those six valuation models taught me one clear conclusion, that transaction does not drive price, store value drives price. So mm. people could be using XRP to transact all day long because you're buying and selling it. It's really just to move agreements to exchange the property rights associated with value. But store a value when people start to think, you know what, I'm out of the dollar. I don't, I don't, I need something else to store my profit. That is where all currency, I mean, that's really what a reserve currency is about. It's not about using dollars to buy stuff. It's about storing your wealth in dollars slash treasuries because you got to store your wealth somewhere. If we see the shift from storing wealth in dollars to XRP, that would be a massive increase in so price. to me that's the fundamental thing you have to store the value in xrp because no. if you don't like i don't if you don't the only value the only time xrp's value might go up is when these large assets are transacted with for three to five seconds that makes it volatile if let's say hypothetically nobody stored value in xrp and all of a sudden a big huge transaction 100 trillion dollars moves through the network it's going to massively increase the price. It's going to not be stable. So let's say that a nation had XRP, they were holding it and they used it as collateral for a loan. The price goes up and down. That is not going to help anyone. So I don't think that it will only be for a transaction value because there would be incredible volatility in the price. And nobody in the banking world likes volatility, especially with a reserve currency or something in the background. But you also need transactions to happen. So, so I would counter that that nobody in the banking industry likes volatility. With investment banks live on volunteer. Well, volatility. I guess I meant for something they're using as a collateral for a loan. I should have clarified. Well, I, and but since now the, the mandatory minimum reserves for the United States is zero percent of what's out there, and they've been investing. Um, now for the last few years, and that's why these banks are failing is because they're going out and they're investing this money in equities um, and bonds. So now volatility is where they stand to make their money and they're cutthroat. They're, they're probably wanting more volatility. You know, um, real quick, uh, <laughs> based on what Molly said too, uh, what she was talking about is store of value, right? But this again ties back to what I keep pushing on is liquidity. As the global liquidity continues to drop, the institutions are gonna to have to rethink the sustainable monetary supply. And they're gonna to have to find out solutions to provide liquidity in different currencies, right? Um, another thing that does disturb, like really I think about a lot is the de decoupling of financial markets from Bitcoin. And that's really what I, I, I think a lot when I start to look at the cartel banking system and whatnot, this, uh, some, if there's a war going on between the Davos and, you know, the Wall Street, it really has something to do with Bitcoin also being in the center of this. Uh, but it, there's going to have to be a major shift in financial markets for the decoupling of Bitcoin and uh, XRP and other technologies to decouple from that. But there would also have to be a demand for the adoption of XRP to transfer value and storing wealth as well. So... I don't know. Well, we also look at you also look at Russia becoming the second biggest mining pool now, uh, you know, power of mining pool of the BTC network. If Russia becomes number one and actually controls fifty one percent of the mining pool, what do you think they're going to label the BTC network as? Well, and it's been Chinese owned for the last five six years now, um, well, without any question. But we're talking about Russia now. 11,000 sanctions since the war started, 1,100 from the U.S. and, and from other nations. If, if Russia, and not China now, if Russia controls 
you know, 51% of the mining pool, what happens to the Bitcoin network? Nothing. I, I don't. Nothing? No, because you're, you're forgetting about the halving in one year from now. The halving also I, 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 is I, I, also I around election you. time, which is very interesting. That's Every right. four years, there's the, and then we have the elections, <laughs> um, and God knows with whatever. I'm, everything I'm else not a real on. smart fella. I'm not a real smart fella, but I, I have a, a knack for breaking things down super simple. So mm -hmm. if everybody will take a, I think Patrick and I, I've been watching him. I think Patrick and I are on the same page. I really do. But I want everybody to just walk with me for a second. And we're going we're gonna to stand on the floor in our basement. And we're looking at the stairs that are going up. Right now, we're on the basement floor. We're on the basement floor with no adoption, no nothing. And the price of, bit, the price of XRP is going to look just like your set of stairs going upstairs. It's not a stock. It's not legacy thinking. It's going to go up, plateau, up, plateau, and it's going to come on. It's going to go that way based on the utility brought into the system. And mm -hmm. everybody's thought process is always on on kind of in the in the legacy frame of mind where value comes from something. But it could very easily, and Molly touched on this, Versan touched on this, it's already set. No World Bank and no, no, no business of any salt is going to come into an agreement with Ripple with the assumption that it's going to be volatile. They're going to agree to a stable price at X amount of input, it will be this, plus a buffer. Mm -hmm. At the next yes. plateau, there's more utility. The higher price automatically, algorithmically kicks in to accommodate that utility brought on. So you want to bring all those wonderfully big numbers that Robert told us about? You start adding all that into side chains to the XRPL, the corresponding value will grow on the token to give it its value to be able to transmit that value. Now, Molly touched on something about banks holding XRP, but let's not forget about the Basel Three that started in January that limits a bank to only being able to hold 2%. So the How does higher, that work if you have the option agreement, though? Is that considered? Well, they can't hold it. It doesn't matter. See, I think maybe as early as we are, these, and everybody I think can agree to the 1,700 plus contracts for XRP that are being held out, don't know who they are. So there's some of your escrow, and I've, I've got my notepad. I'm back sitting in the truck. But currently, there's 48.2 billion XRP locked up. Can we, can we assume that's in the escrow? Sure. I mean, there's only, there's 51.8 billion available. Available. How, how much did Ripple buy back since the lawsuit? $8.4 billion worth of XRP. Where is that XRP? In the escrow. When they say buy back, they put it back in escrow. Okay, so but but eight point four billion dollars between thirty and forty cents is like sixteen to eighteen billion XRP. So where's it where's that I mean are you following the math there, right? Oh absolutely. If, if it's at a dollar if it was at a dollar, that'd be eight point four billion XRP. If it was at fifty cents, it would be sixteen point eight billion xrp if it was between 30 and 40 cents it would be 18 billion 19 billion xrp so if you're only saying there's you know 48 billion in escrow where where'd the rest of this xrp go right and well and, uphold and uphold has one billion dollars worth at today's prices 
So they have two billion. They have about two, two roughly over two billion. So they have roughly over two percent of the XRP. Coinbase has what? They have three or four billion XRP. I thought. I mean, I mean yeah. It, available is not in escrow, if I understand that correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're talking about exchanges, but. How much physically? There's no, no way. None, 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 no one on this call knows a way to physically figure out exactly how much is in escrow and how much is in Ripple's wallets, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I've been searching and trying to figure this whole part out. Um, uh, I, I know Patrick had some ideas. I tried to kind of go down those roads, but I, I was unsuccessful. Uh, but if we can really get a good I, uh, idea and understanding of the actual circulating supply. Right, because all their remittance partners need need XRP too uh, to facilitate remittances and all these other things, right? Uh, so, uh, what is the real circulating supply of XRP? Available. It's not because they're using not, the exchanges. They're using exchanges right now. Yeah. For liquidity. Yeah. Okay, so that's because the exchanges have them. Right. But now, sure. now let's go. Let's go to another a, a, a higher a higher plane here, and say that we reach clarity, and they release the kraken. The NDAs are off. All these people flood in. The seventeen plus contracts are gone, and the secondary market's gone, guys and lady. It's gone. So now the only thing left, the only thing left to make ODL is XLS 30D. Interesting. Interesting. Is that, can you, you guys all okay. agree on that? Because there's, there's, no, there's no spare. There's no spare sitting around. Now, just this weekend at Consensus, David Schwartz had an interview on the street that was recorded by somebody about five feet away. And he specifically said that he is not the least bit excited about the collateralization of XRP to make money. He is more excited, and I don't know if everybody here knows what this is, but the XLS 38D which is for a cross-chain bridge. XLS 38D brings everything, tying everything together. Cross-chain cross -chain bridges. Interoperability. So, again, he's more excited about the, the trading pairs in the XLS 30D than he is about actually collateralizing the the purchasing power or the value of XRP from an institution and getting money for it. What's yeah, that tell you? He has to separate himself from XRP, right? He's Ripple the company, not XRP ledger head, right? So, uh, you know, you got to take what he says at face value, right? He has to keep the two separated. Also, you got to remember that, right? He, he doesn't work for XRP. He works for Ripple, the company who built their baking software on top of the XRP venture. Which emphasizes my statement even further. Well, also, so, you know, we have to acknowledge his background too. I mean, his background, I think, really yeah. ties into a, a lot of what he's talking about because he, he was a former puppet for the National Security Agency. You know, I wouldn't take everything he said at, like, like Robert said, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt, uh, maybe two even. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt come from the last few weeks from David Schwartz. And that alone, yeah. just, you know, caught my attention. And I said, something unusual is happening here because, I mean, guys, we really, you know, we, we understand what's happening here. I mean, everything else around this is now becoming fluff. And uh, it's really c distracting people from the, the utility of this technology and the bridging that it's doing from the traditional banking system into the new financial system that is now emerging. Uh, Patrick, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would back up Versan and just say that David Schwartz has intentionally um, 
torpedoed the conversation repeatedly over the weeks. And I, I would say at this point, nothing he says can be um, taken with anything but a grain of salt. Um, not that we don't all, you know, love David, but yep. uh, I, I don't value his opinion at this point or his statements. Same here. Also, the, anybody who's associated with the, being a developer on XRP Ledger generally does not want to engage in any discussions around the store of value side. They are very interested in the technology, the utility, that's what interests them. So it would not surprise me that the CTO of a technology company, a fintech company, would be very excited about a technology innovation and less excited about something that a speculative investor, retail investor would care about. We don't have the same agenda. It, right. We don't. And if yeah. you're watching David Schwartz, pay attention to Polygon more so than than XRP right now. Polysign? Polysign? Or Polysign, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, I know they, they've just woken up the last couple of weeks here. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it does sound like uh, we are going to be maybe able to uh, custody our assets with them and uh, use those assets to uh, make a couple percent by loaning them uh, through different... Uh, See, I mean, I, I don't know, man. I just think I think the XRP ledger is 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 perfect for the entire derivatives market, right? You have all these different currencies and all these different countries, uh, you know, buying in to these futures contracts and, and whatever they are, right? And you have the perfect bridge asset in the middle with all the liquidity needed for all of the currency pairs, right? When that contract is finished, when A and B are met, C is done, right? And, and that's what the smart contract is for. Has to be ISO compliant. Uh, being a bridge asset would extremely help. And there's only so many of those that have been sandbox tested, tested the last 10 years by the entire world, right? So like th th that is the reason I believe that the value of the derivatives market, the value has to live somewhere. And if the correspondent banking system is ending, right? And we're going to a digital system, right? If, if it's a trillion dollars in digital money, whether it's in USDC or whatever, if it's on the XRPL, I, I still believe in my heart that that value now lives on the XRPL. And, and I, I know we still haven't really solved that question, uh, but where else does it live? If not, well, let, me, let me ask you a question, Robert. Right now, in the derivatives market, when you buy one, where does it live? I, I would I, I I don't own any derivatives, man. So I, I couldn't I, I I that is not my cup of tea. Uh, if you if you know, please enlighten us. Please share. Well, I don't. I don't. I was asking a legitimate question, Patrick. Do you know where a derivative lives after you purchase it, or Versan? Where the value lives, right? No, 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 no. Okay, the value is the derivative. Yes. Yeah. Effectively, it's vaporware. It lives in that you can redeem it. That's it. Okay. They're agreement. Mm -hmm. So if, I, if I'm going to sell you the option to buy something at a certain price, I have to have that thing so that I could sell it to you at that price. So whatever okay. the thing is typically has value. So wherever that thing lives, if it's a stock, if it's barrels of oil or bushels of corn, whatever. So I don't know if there's one answer to where all derivatives live because it depends on well, what exactly a... you are deriving the, yeah. the value from. Yes. Well, and there's it's not where the derivative lives. It it's where the value lives. That's his question. And the answer, yeah, and the answer is very simple. The answer is, is very, very simple in that nothing will change except for the payment rail that pays for it instantaneously. No, because now you're using digital money though, right? Because you're, you're using, you're using, you're using, you know, USDC, or whatever the stable coin is that is going to be, you know, XUSD or whatever it's going to be, you're using a stable coin now in this new, der derivatives are coming onto the blockchain. So you can't use cash equivalent, right, on the blockchain, right? You can't say, hey, here's my fiat money on the blockchain. So it has to be in a, in a, in a currency that is a currency pair on that chain. So what it, backs, it what backs USDC, it, Robert? It treasury bills usually different securities, a different things. Dollar like money. A dollar, right? Sure. Real real quick. A dollar um, backs USDC. Yeah, Vasan? Huh? Well, a, a derivative is really just a financial contract. And again, when we talk about yeah. um, these new payment rails, that's what uh, you said, future. Uh, 
the payment rails. Yeah. That's basically what the Ripple protocol is. So a lot of these institutions could be adopting the payment rails onto their payment platforms. That's basically updating their banking system. That's all. It's a new digital ledger without even using XRP just yeah. yet, but they could still be using the payment rails to move value back and forth uh, without even using XRP just yet. You know, so the value of XRP has not been even we're, we're, we're not, that's why the price is so low. It's because it's not being utilized just yet. Um, you know, because they're still using the traditional banking system, yet they've uh, adopted the Ripple protocol onto their payment rails. So there are two things happening at the same time here. But again, XRP is not Ripple. It's two different things. Um, a lot of people right. uh, very much so. still don't understand. I'm glad we can clear that up. They're two very different things. So... Well, they used to be the same thing, but now they're 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 two different things. Well, I, I just totally I just see the world coming to a point where you've got a derivatives market built on a blockchain, and the New York Stock okay. Exchange built on a blockchain, and your trading pairs on the blockchain. And you're sitting there, and when you want to transact and buy a derivative, it will you'll pair off. You'll pair off in, in digital money, though, right? In di in digital money, well, because but, but derivatives. You're in digital money now. You don't hand anybody a dollar to buy something. So no, no, you're no, in no. digital money now. We're, we're we're talking about correspondent banking system to to CBDC system. Yeah, we're talking about the two different systems here. Future, right? You can't you can't use fiat in the new in the new system, right? Right? It, it's going to be uh, a USDC or whatever whatever they decide to use as the the US's CBDC or the the French CBDC or the Euro the Euro CBDC that it's going to be decided in October in twenty twenty three. Um, you know, there's still all of these different, am I losing connection? Shit. Um, You're good. I, I don't know, man. I hear you. I, 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 I think we're, we're talking similar things, but the value is all going to live on the blockchain eventually here, right? Over the next several years, right? There's going to be no more, you know, paper value out here left in la la land. Eventually, they're going to get rid of all dollars, whether that takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You're going to start seeing paper money in museums, right? Because that system is entirely broken. So, uh, you know, where, where where do we head from here? And, you know, I, I still don't think we've, we've gotten a full answer. And I guess maybe we all just don't really. Well, know. I think I think that's actually well, I, I don't even I don't think that's necessarily the, the question or debate to have because just yet anyway, because. When when I've I, when I spoke to R three, they were very clear that cash is really useful, and it's going to be in circulation for as long as they can possibly allow it to be, um, and so, and also, CBDCs are going to be the new fiat, and they're going to relate exactly to some cash, right? It's going to have a one to one value to to physical items as well. And they're going to have that for as long as they can because there is actually use in cash. And, and the, the uses for that, they were they seem to place a heavy emphasis. And this is on an unreleased interview, actually. Now I'm thinking about it. It's not actually public. Um, <laughs> they, were saying, they, were making, they were making an emphasis on the older community who don't use even the digital banking system, who only use cash. And actually, there's like a, a moral code that they, they have to run against because they, they actually can't switch over to digital because they they alienate people who only use cash and that puts people in danger in the country that they're trying to kind of it's, help. It's going to take, it's take, I mean, look at, I think it was what, Nairobi or whatever, where they tried to just totally get rid of the cash system and go full digital and there was an uprising and, you know, banks were being, you know, blown up and all this crazy stuff, right? They're, they're not going to come out and tell you, hey, guys, we're getting rid of cash because their guns would be on the streets before you know it. It's going to be a very slow process, but eventually fiat money, right, as it lives now, right, it, you know, um, uh, uh, future uh, reserve currencies are, are only last so long, right? And we're already at 100 years for the U.S. dollar, right? We, we don't have much longer, right? And so are they going to keep a, a fiat USD dollar around that has, uh, you know, 10, 12 percent? 
you know, in, in inflation or, or are they going with this new digital system? I mean, I don't even know how they're going to figure that out as well, too. But um, well, they're, of course, they're not going to tell you that they're going to get rid of cash as fast because because people people will be, you know, there'll be a huge uprising. But that will happen in our lifetimes. Trust me. Well, cash so is you're right. Going so I, I think. Please, Patrick, sorry. Yeah, so I, I think one of the common misunderstandings people have is they think that there's a government out there planning all of this stuff to make, you know, a CBDC and this and that. It's not the government. The government has absolutely no idea what they're doing 99% of the time with just about anything, and they're never going to process it in time. It's corporate interests are planning our future, right? So who are the corporate interests? And we're looking at obviously JP Morgan, we're looking at Ripple. Uh, these different corporations are fighting over what's going to be the future of the United States. Um, so that's why things like Facebook with their, um, I forget what they try to call it, Libra. Libra. Yeah, Libra. that was shot down by Congress because it had the potential to truly overthrow the United States with a digital currency. Yep. Um, so something will take over, but it's going to be whoever has the most lobbyists, the most money in the most pockets of politicians, because the politicians, they still have no idea what's going on at all. And that's sad. Um, and that's sad. Yeah, I, I've testified at a few different states. I've talked to many secretaries of state. Uh, most of them just don't get this. The legislators don't get this. Uh, so it's going to come down to that spending. So Ripple in 2022 was the second largest lobbyist for the United States, spending about, uh, if I remember right, it was around 15 million, which is almost nothing when it comes to lobbying dollars. So we're still so premature and early in this as far as the adoption curve of what's going to get spent on lobbying and on getting politicians in a position to adopt. Uh, it's still anybody's game, honestly, as far as what the end result is. Because if you think the government has an actual plan, I promise you they don't. Yeah. They have no idea what's going on. Absolutely. I, um, I, I can attest to that because I've been having conversations with, you know, Digital Pound Foundation, Payments Association. Um, that They don't know what's going on. They have no idea. Um, and they're all trying to even just figure out the questions to ask in the first place, which just shows how far behind they are. I know Molly had uh, looked like you were itching to say something, maybe, or not. No. Um, okay. okay, so uh, Versan, I know you tried to say something a little bit earlier. We're going to finish with this, um, so let us know what you're thinking. Oh, um, well, uh, you know, back to everything we're talking about, the transition, again, it's happening faster because I think the country right now, they're about to start having an honest conversation about the state of the global economy and the currency crisis. Uh, because we all depend on the dollar and it's not just us, it's the rest of the world. And for too long, you know, we put our faith in a system that is fundamentally flawed. And I, I think people are now waking up to the reality of the situation. Uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that we've been scammed on a global scale. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, the, the transition is yeah. happening and, you know, there's still time to get ready. I, like you guys have said, and me, myself, we're early. Um, a lot of it is unfolding, but that's why it's so important for us to understand also what's happening happening as far as regulation. I think it really plays a big key role into this because a lot of what we're talking about is about regulation, really, uh, because we still don't know how this is going to unfold, but we have a very clear understanding and idea based on the heavy data and research. So it's just interesting to see how this is going to play out. Absolutely. Um, well, that wraps up uh, a decent sized conversation there with a decent amount of people as well. Um, first time trying this. Maybe we'll do it again. We'll see how the edit comes out. Um, but if anyone wants to follow any of these uh, wonderful people on social media and see their content that they put out, if you haven't already been familiar, all of the links are below. Um, to to them, that will be below. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, and we'll talk again soon.